Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the time. I rise today in support of H.R. 796 and the rule providing for consideration of H.R. 4768, the Separation of Powers Restoration Act. And I want to thank uh, not only the chairman, but also my friend from Texas, uh, Congressman Ratcliffe, for introducing this legislation and bringing it through the Judiciary Committee. Uh, this is something we've had hearings on, we have had uh, work done on, and I'm proud to be an original co-sponsor of H.R. 4768. And I'm glad to see it moving forward today. The Judiciary Committee discussed these concepts, worked on these concepts, looked at the whole issue. And frankly, this is one that in many ways, except for the very partisan nature of what we're doing in Congress these days, and it is, and there's things we disagree on, this one to me should have really be one that frankly shouldn't be partisan and is in regards to a administrative uh, determination that they will veto it. I'm not sure that their machine knows anything else except to send us an administrative statement saying they're going to veto it. I've been on the Rules Committee a year and a half now, and I think I've seen one bill that they thought maybe we could sign. Now, there's a balance between both, but that doesn't bother me near as much as putting forth policy that actually helps and in, in, in puts forward ideas that make sense. The Separation of Powers Restoration Act amends the Administrative Procedures Act to overturn two doctrines that call for judicial deference to agency interpretation of statutory and regulatory provisions, the Chevron and our doctrines. These legally descriptions of the bills may sound dry, but its importance cannot be understated. Let's just put it in plain English. The Separation of Powers Restoration Act ensures federal bureaucrats can't interpret the legality of their own regulation at the expense of hardworking Americans or the separation of powers. The United States Constitution clearly defines the duties of each branch of government, but today the executive branch far too often acts as a lawmaker or law interpreter when it is supposed to be a law enforcer. And for this congressman, this is both parties. I do not want the executive to take this constitutional role of this body. I don't care who sits in the White House. This is not something that should be taking place, and it has taken place over time. And we've got to come to understanding why this matters. You see, this is a serious threat to the separation of powers, and I believe the administration has gone out of its way to try and ignore or to rewrite what they don't like from up here. The Chevron and our doctrines are helping them justify these unacceptable actions. Executive branches should be seen not as law-making authorities, but instead almost as expert advisors or witnesses on regulation. But under the Chevron Doctrine, agencies essentially got the power to make policy when Congress either explicitly or implicitly delegated the power. Under Chevron Doctrine or Chevron Deference, agencies are essentially free to define the meaning of statutes that they administer, and the courts defer to the agency interpretation. Now, just, Mr. Speaker, just for a moment, listen there. The courts have set up under the Chevron Doctrine saying basically this may be what Congress said. Here's what unelected officials have said. We're going to side with them. At what point does in the judicial frame of reference does that make sense when they are to be the interpreter of the law written in these bodies, in this building, instead of those down the street who have decided in their own infinite wisdom that they know better than those here? Now, they may have larger degrees. They may have longer time. They may have forever. That's fine. If they want to make law, let them put their money down and run for Congress. Do not make law from the cubicle. And that's what we're seeing. And unfortunately, the courts have said, you know, we're going to side with the executive in this. In my opinion, out of the realm of what the Constitution actually states. In other words, really what the courts are saying is that to avoid interpreting the law, they're allowing agencies who wrote the regulations free to play political games or to do whatever they want to do. The Separation of Powers Restoration Act will address this situation. It replaces the current standard review with a requirement that the courts review challenged agency decisions without deference or regard to the agency's legal conclusions. This will ensure that unelected bureaucrats are not left to write and interpret laws to achieve political gain at the expense of the American people. Federal regulations impose more than $1.88 trillion, T, trillion dollars on the economy. The regulatory burden and unelected bureaucrats who implement it have spun it out of control, and it is the taxpayer of America that is left holding the bag. I'm tired of it. I know the American people are tired of it. When I go home, this is one of the first things that's talked about is the overreach and a continuous burden of a bureaucracy that seems to be completely out of control. In Northeast Georgia, examples of regulatory burden include everything from ill-conceived requirements for the poultry industry 
to new labor requirements that impact manufacturers, to a silica rule effect on the granite industry in Elberton. It runs across the spectrum. In fact, that last one, the silica rule, they can't even measure what they're wanting to enforce. Explain to me how that helps business. Explain to me how that actually helps anyone when you can't measure what you're wanting to actually enforce. Except it sounds good. It's a great press release, as I've heard here today. The press release is at the expense of American business and not in the constitutional principles in which we operate on. Part of the problem, this is just an array of power. In fact, last month, the D.C. Circuit Court relied heavily on the Chevron deference to uphold federal communications open Internet order, also known as net neutrality rule. That rule attempts to regulate our way into new innovation and is a huge blow to Internet freedom. The FCC said it was acting in the interest of fairness and competition, but in reality, it stifled fairness and competition. Shocker there, Mr. Speaker. What government typically interferes with typically doesn't do what they intend it to do. We can go through program after program and see that. The FCC rule would slow Internet speeds, increase consumer prices, and hamper infrastructure development, including at my home in northeast Georgia, in my home district. Rather than interpreting the legality of the rule, the court decision basically said it was acceptable for federal agencies to rewrite the law to suit political whims. The court deferred to the agency's interpretation of its own rules. I wish I had that ability to say with a federal agency such as maybe the IRS. I'm just going to write them a little letter and say, you know, I've interpreted the law differently. I don't owe anything this year. Thanks for asking. And have the court uphold mine. You think they would go along with that? No. Of course, this is the same IRS that has one person in, char in control of 20 plus over 700, almost a million people, and they have one customer service agent in my district. I don't think they care really about that. But you see, if you go back to this right here, it's interpretation. And the court said, you know, interpret your own rules. Do what you want to do. The Severon Doctrine is bankrupt when it comes to the separation of powers. We've got to get back to a way that this actually does this. And this simply does this. And this is not new. This is not something that is unheard of. Importantly, the bill would also extend the requirement that is not only judicial review under the Administrative Procedures Act, but also various many APAs scattered throughout the U.S. Code. For example, the Clean Air Act includes its own individual version of the APA. This bill ensures cases like that can't escape. We need to reverse the course. It's time we stop diminishing congressional authority and handing the power over to the agencies. It's past time we restore the checks and balances that a founder built into this system. This is where, Mr. Speaker, it's understandable. We can have differences of opinion on this floor. In fact, that is what our country was based on. And we're going to have different opinions and different ways to go about it. But what I cannot understand is on this floor, when we can't even come together to say we will hold for our own authority, our own congressional constitutional authority, and say we'll happily give it and let the court say that folks who have not elected, who will be there maybe long after we're gone, can decide that, you know, that's not what Congress really meant, whether it be a Democrat Congress or a Republican Congress, a Democrat president or a Republican president. The Constitution was set up with three branches. Three, not one. And just because the one, the executive feels that because inaction on the Hill can allow it to do whatever it wants, is no excuse to go by the law. And it's even less excuse that the courts would turn a blind eye to the intent of Congress. That's what this is about. Now, we're going to hear everything else today on this rule. I would just wanted to take a few minutes just to talk about the actual rule before you, not everything else. We'll have plenty of time on that. But this bill is a good bill. It does what it needs to do, and it restores both for Republicans and Democrats and the American people what it needs to have. And with that, I yield.